everyone. I want to welcome you to Spokane Community College <clears throat> this morning for the spring quarter 2022 Community College of the Spokane Town Hall with our Chancellor, Dr. Christine Johnson. Uh, my name is Kevin Brockbank. I'm the president here at Spokane Community College. And to, before we get to the event and our speaker, I want to start with our native land acknowledgement statement. We are honored to acknowledge that the community colleges of Spokane and our main campuses for Spokane Falls and Spokane Community College are located on the traditional and sacred homelands of the Spokane tribe. We also provide services in a region that includes the traditional and sacred homelands of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation and the Kalispell Tribe. We pay our respects to tribal elders, both past and present, as well as to all indigenous people today. This land holds their cultural DNA, and we are honored and grateful to be here on their traditional lands. We give thanks to the legacy of the original people and their descendants, and pledge to honor their stewardship and values. So with that, I'd like to do a short introduction of Dr. Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson first joined CCS in 2010. For over a decade, <clears throat> has led the most complex district that spans six counties over a 12,300 square mile area. It includes Spokane Falls Community College and Spokane Community College, as well as our rural learning centers, our Head Start facilities, early learning centers, and more than 2,000 employees. As many of you know, this is Dr. Johnson's final year at the helm of our colleges. She announced her retirement earlier this year, which will go into effect on December 31st. So I think it's also appropriate at this point to recognize the legacy of leadership Dr. Johnson has provided the colleges throughout that time, and her push for a continuous improvement at both the colleges and the district throughout that process. And why we're here today is her response to some things that came out early this year in an employee engagement survey uh, where our stakeholders and employees asked for uh, more communications and opportunities, and this is part of her promise to fulfill that ask. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Jonathan Glover, who will be emceeing our event today. He is our communications director, and he will talk to you a little bit about how we'll uh, work with our in-person and online um, individuals, okay? So as I walk into the stage here. There you go, John. All right, thank you so much. Okay. So that is on, yep. Okay, welcome everybody, thanks for coming. Um, to the folks in the auditorium and online, we are streaming this as well. Um, following a short address from Dr. Johnson, we're going to open the floor up to questions. Um, if you're in person, please just raise your hand and one of our uh, lovely helpers here will come and pass you a microphone. Make sure you talk into the microphone, please. Um, and for the online crowd, same thing. If you have a question, please just type it into chat and I will make sure that I see it and that Dr. Johnson. Bank. Um, I want to say good morning to all of you, and I want to say good morning to everyone who is uh, joining us online. Um, I must uh, introduce a couple of introductions since I know I see people that are very important to CCS and to uh, do a, a great job in starting with us. I want to introduce Brianne Riley. If you would stand, Brianne, uh, though not everyone can see you, Brianne has joined uh, uh, my office and the Board of Trustees as the new Executive Assistant, and we're very happy she's with us. She's a graduate of Eastern Washington University. And I must also introduce Dan Brown. Dan has a very important role. Uh, Dan comes to us most recently from Washington State University. He is our Chief Security Officer, and at a time when there is great threat, uh, cyber threats across the country and the world. We're very happy to, Dan, uh, to have Dan with us and his expertise. So thank you, Dan, and thank you, Brianne. So as uh, President Bronkbank mentioned to you, and as uh, Jonathan has said, uh, as a part of our new strategic plan, uh, the feedback that we had is uh, the uh, colleagues within CCS would like opportunities to ask questions about what's going on. So really, it's your opportunity to ask me here now or online about what's going on at CCS. And the one thing I will just uh, initiate with you, and you can ask more questions, as you know, the Board of Trustees has the sole responsibility for selecting a chancellor. And it's one of the, the jobs that they take very seriously. Uh, they are in conversations uh, on which search firm to hire. And again, all of these are their decisions. 
the uh, search firms that are uh, available to do presidential searches are many, and some have approval in the state to be state vendors, so our, our Board of Trustees takes that into consideration, because if the board were to select a firm that is not on the approval list, it would just take longer to launch it. Uh, you should also know that the trustees organization ensures that board of trustee members who are all civic leaders all across the state, they have their own organization, and they are provided opportunities to ask questions. Often the attorney general uh, joins to ask questions. Uh, as you know, any hire, any hire is a legal agreement between that employee and the employer and with uh, uh, executive searches. Boards take uh, very, that very seriously. And just last week on Friday, all the trustees across the state uh, had a half day meeting on uh, how to conduct a search so that it, it, to ensure that it goes well the way that the, the board members want. And as you might know, um, uh, this is not the open, my, my, I'll be retiring in December, uh, and other colleges have retirements in June. So there are about uh, 13 searches going on right now across the state in our system. And that is as a result of a we baby boomers are kind of exiting at the same time. So trustees are concerned and want to make sure they, their next appointment and selection is a good one. So I just want you to know they take their role very seriously. They're getting information and questions. And uh, uh, the consultants also provided information about what not to do. And they had some interesting stories about searches that have not gone well, not in Washington, but across the country. So just for your information, I'm going to now open it up to your questions. And Jonathan, I know you have other questions that come online. So I'm going to invite you and the audience to ask some questions. And if I don't have an answer now, I'll make sure that you get an answer and uh, appreciate that I have a, an amazing uh, cabinet of colleagues that uh, would have the answer if I do not. So let's hear it from you, unless you want me to call on you, and I know you don't want me to call on you. <laughs> so any questions from the audience? Anyone? Grace Leaf, please. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. My question is, um, it's been almost a decade since you started here, and if you can think back to your first 90 days, if you could give the new chancellor advice about one thing they should do during the first 90 days of their role, what would it be? Well, a lot, Grace, uh, let me uh, repeat that question if you didn't hear it. Is, um, uh, she mentioned I've been here over a decade, and what advice would I give a new chancellor? And I will say, first of all, that I followed an excellent chancellor that had been here a good many years, Gary Livingston. And he was very generous with me in terms of spending time, first of all, telling me what a terrific team of people make up a community college of Spokane, and he was exactly right. So what I would give to that chancellor is exactly the advice that Gary Livingston gave me, get to know your people. It's a really wonderful team, and it is indeed. You're a magnificent team, and so that would be first and foremost. And then there are many things. You know, we have a great board, and the, the relationship between the executive and the board is really important. They expect really good communication to keep them informed. You know, they don't um, make decisions that are management decisions, but they give advice. And so if there's a big problem, I always share with them. And by the way, uh, we have to do that during the board meeting or in executive session because it, it would be unlawful if, if uh, they were making decisions outside of that setting. The, the, the rules for boards are very, very uh, strict about making their decisions in public. So they can hear a lot of information. Uh, however, a decision is made, discussed in executive session, and clearly personnel matters or financial matters or other matters are always... Uh, a, a, done in, in executive session, so there isn't a public there, but their decision has to be public. Once they've decided, they go out and they have to vote in public to say what they've done. But um, going back to the other question, those would be get to know your people and really, really spend time with the board. They're magnificent professionals. They're very experienced. They're very knowledgeable. They understand their role. And first and foremost, they care about our students. And this board, as with the strategic plan, has said students first, and they mean it. And so that, that would be the advice I would give a, 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 the next chancellor. Other questions? Don't be shy. Yes, please. 
thank you for thank you for standing too. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, having this, Dr. Johnson. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Brent Munoz, the IT Innovation Officer. Um, <clears throat> so the pandemic has made uh, a whole lot of things challenging and, and been very disruptive. And uh, we're kind of re-socializing at this point. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm wondering if, so tie it into Grace's question and your answer for it. Um, if there's a, kind of a commitment on leadership's part to help kind of lead that re-socializing. Um, rally the troops, uh, become more familiar with each other. Um, and I have a suggestion that I, I could share if you'd like to hear it. But Please share it, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I, I think it'd be fantastic to have like a uh, future leader lunches where you know, we maybe we rotate different folks come in and they get to sit with the chancellor once in a while or they sit with some of the other uh, uh, executives just and some of the administrators to really, you know, kind of build that community network, make everyone feel like they're part of the team and, mm -hmm. And if you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. Uh, uh, for those of, well, for our audience online, uh, the question was about, um, you know, communicating with leaders uh, within uh, our system. And uh, Brent, your suggestions are excellent. I, first of all, I think it's a great idea for uh, new people and new leaders. Uh, but the broader question was about how we reconnect. And it's true, it's a challenge for every single business. Uh, of all kinds, whether it's education or private business, the re-socialization and reconnecting is really vital. And um, I believe that in education in particular, we're a people business. We're about human development. We're about helping students become all that they can be because they've got so much talent. And our role is to help them develop that talent. And one of those huge uh, talents that's so essential is how we connect and communicate with others. And I think at a time in our world and in our country, there are so many tensions and misunderstandings that we need to really emphasize the opportunity to get to know each other as human beings and as um, colleagues within CCS. We have a powerful mission. Uh, it's one that I know people really feel and embrace about doing the right thing for our students and it takes us working together and understanding each other to do the right thing for the students. So excellent question, and I welcome all of your ideas, but that's a good one of just uh, the management, the cabinet uh, hosting opportunities to welcome new people and create opportunities for leaders to come together. We do that in, uh, you know, I know colleges do the, the uh, administ administrative council meetings and dean's meetings and all, but more formally also with new people. So thank you for your suggestion, Brent. Other questions or comments? Don't be shy. This is a group of friends and colleagues. And I also hope, uh, Jonathan, that there, there might be questions online. Uh, yep. it, I really would like to hear what you have to say. Yes. Yeah, so if there's, if there's no more in the audience at this moment, we, do, we did get a, a big group of questions in beforehand, and we actually have one online um, from Emily R. Uh, does the chancellor have any future projects that will carry over to the new chancellor? <laughs> oh, there's always unfinished work, and a lot of it is just underway. Um, first and foremost, I have to say, we have an amazing new strategic plan. It's an amazing strategic plan, and I hope you've taken, many of you participated, but that you've taken time to, to read it. It's not a big, thick book. It's a, a very slim and very focused group of priorities. And of course, it's learning first. And if you just look at the data that we are committing to providing and tracking all of our students so that one is they uh, complete their, their plan, whether it's a degree or a certificate, and how we're going to track and support them along the way. That is ongoing work. We're certainly not done. We've uh, been working on it, but there's a lot of work to do. So that to me is the main thing for our new chancellor is we've got a strategic plan that was developed with two of our board members who co-chaired it and um, uh, selected members that were recommended by uh, the Washington Federation of State Employees and our Association of Higher Ed, so it was made up of faculty and classified and exempt personnel, and we, we just, and members of the cabinet and the board members, and we did a lot of research on it. We did surveys and we did uh, uh, groups of uh, discussions, 
and uh, really it was, it was a joint effort and it was adopted by our board. That is setting uh, the direction and the work and it's a considerable work because what we're saying is we've got a lot of work to do. We don't have enough students that are finishing and completing their credentials. We have uh, gaps in learning among uh, different student populations. We know that many students who, are, uh, students who are students of color lag behind in completion and, um, and in success overall. So big, big things. And uh, also important was the, the notion of better communication. And I have to say, communication is something we just, we're never done with good communication. We have to keep saying, what new ways uh, do we have? What old ways do we keep? But, and that's communication throughout, from at the colleges, at the district office, among employee groups, uh, so a lot of work. So, so to, uh, I would say the emphasis is strategic plan, take it seriously, move it forward. And I think we have the direction and the capacity and the leadership, by the way, we have fantastic faculty leadership, classified employee leadership, management leadership. I think we've got the right team to do the right job and to do it well. So yeah, Dr. Johnson, speaking of communication, um, how do you think, and, and again, this, these are questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, how do you think our colleges can better connect with Gen Z and younger? Oh, Gen Z, hmm. I am not the expert on Gen Z other than I have uh, you know, family members of every generation. And uh, I, I, would, uh, I think we've got a lot of work to do. I know they're very, very IT savvy and I know that they use so many tools and they're very well informed about a broad range of issues. Uh, they m may not be as focused as we want them to be, but they get a lot of information a lot of different ways. So one thing would be is to find ways to communicate that meet our student populations in a way that we haven't. Uh, I think, uh, Jonathan, you and the whole team are doing magnificent work and it's getting better. And I think we have to keep going because uh, there are, it's a, a very complex communication. I know they get I have uh, nieces and nephews who do, I can't even remember the list of things they, where they get their information. It's uh, organizations I had never heard of. And I'm sure that's, uh, that's uh, happening with our students and their families as well. So lots of work on the communication side. Definitely, earlier you mentioned the strategic plan. We had a question, um, what major challenges do you expect colleges will have to overcome five or even 10 years down the line? That is a really wonderful and profound question. I don't have to tell you the, uh, the level of change that is happening all over the world, and we'll just stick with higher education for the moment. Major change. Uh, the assumptions we've made about what people want and how they learn and how they choose to learn, all shifting and changing. Just this morning I sent a uh, to the, you know, I, I read broadly, so I, you know, just every day I spend a lot of time reading. I sent to the cabinet an article this morning about, you know, the big new thing is uh, universities with three-year baccalaureate degrees. And it's kind of, they're saying that is a new thing. Well, just think about what that would imply to community colleges who have associates that are three-year degrees. And uh, it's happening right here in Spokane. We have some of our uh, very fine universities going to th some three-year baccalaureates. I know there's huge innovation at SCC with going to a one-year associate degree, and I think that's phenomenal. I mean, I think that's so exciting. But that's just one example. It's changing in every way, everywhere. And I don't think that uh, anyone has all of the answers. I think we're all uh, all higher ed, you know, we're spending a lot of time looking at each other, looking at other sectors. It's a time of great change, great innovation, great opportunity as I see it. And with a leadership team like this one, everything's possible. So great work and great challenge ahead. And the challenges of the cost of education, the value of education, the relevance to employment, those things are foremost in uh, people's mind, parents' mind, students' mind. Uh, I think many of you know we have a $1.5 trillion student debt problem. That's a big debt. Think about it, $1.5 trillion. That's a lot of money that uh, students across America owe. And, uh, you know, that keeps them from uh, doing a lot of other things, maybe owning a home, maybe owning a car, being able to borrow money. And so there's a lot of things that we in higher ed have to 
be a part of the solution and we're working. I can tell you that CCS works very, very closely with our business community. They support us, they challenge us, they expect us to help find solutions. And that's happening in every community. So lots of work, but it's, it's an exciting time. It's a challenging time, but it's an exciting time. So it's not, it's not slow and boring and the same old thing. It's a time for really big ideas, big action, and I have total confidence that CCS will keep leading the way. Caroline Casey. Dr. Johnson, how concerned are you about the political narrative about there not being a value in a college degree these days, and what do you think we all should be doing to to address that narrative? That is a really a wonderful and profound question about what can we do and, and what ideas do I have about challenging the value of people who think there's no value in a college education. And um, I, I, it's unbelievable to me that there are people who think there is no value in education. Education defines us and elevates us as human beings. We learn about ourselves, about our cultures, about our country, about people around us, and then we specialize in areas of interest to us. And we need that expertise. It's a very complex world in every way. And to think that uh, education doesn't have a role in elevating the human condition and elevating us individually and collectively and helping our country stay strong and free and uh, the model for the world, it's very, very troubling and I think we have to challenge it in every way. And I do think that we should be speaking out in different ways and modeling the kind of behavior and reason and logic and respect for each other, for uh, people all around the world and in our own country and just speaking strongly. Uh, that's an area that I really want to do more in. Uh, you know, in, in sometimes in these roles we have to be very, very um, uh, astute about what uh, challenges to take on. And then, uh, you know, when you're a, a citizen just uh, speaking for yourself, it's a very different picture. So I hope to be able to speak on that in a different way uh, down the road. So. Uh, thank you, I, and I encourage you to do that too. I think our students need to see that we value education and we want them to have that opportunity to, to uh, be all that they choose to be and can be and have a right to be. Thank you for your question, Carolyn. Dr. Cosby. Now I know Dr. Cosby well, and his questions as a philosopher, he's a deep thinker, He'll, ha he'll uh, have a very profound question, so I'm ready for it, Dr. Cosby. Wow, no pressure there. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Johnson, for the, the preface. My question is about the relationship between CCS uh, and the state board, mm -hmm. uh, specifically the state board offices, not the nine people on the state board right. itself. But uh, as you alluded earlier, we're part of a larger system statewide of 34 community and technical colleges. Um, so I'm curious, my question is kind of twofold. Uh, with the uh, soon retirement of the current executive director, yeah. Jen Yashawara, uh, I'm, I'm curious about your assessment of current relations between CCS and SBCTC. And then I'm also curious what your hopes are going forward for the new leadership uh, of the state board. Thank you so much, Dr. Cosby. Really, really wonderful question. Um, we are... Uh, part of a very fine system in the country. In fact, I have to tell you that the Washington system of community and technical colleges is often viewed as the best in the country, largely because it's uh, been very deregulated in the sense that local control is honored. We have local boards and our local boards set the policy and direction for each institution. At the same time, we know there is power in the collective of having 34 colleges, their trustees, and so forth, uh, advocate with the legislature. We have been very, very successful in that aspect of it with the legislature, and I have to give uh, our outgoing Jenny Shawara really a big uh, compliment, because this year, for the first time in its history, the community and college uh, uh, system, the Washington system, um, got a billion dollars from the state legislature this legislative session. Now, it's 
spread out among the 34 institutions. Uh, much of it was in the capital, so that, you know, the improvements to the buildings and the technology and so forth. But that's, that's big. I mean, when, when out of a, a, the, the uh, state budget, we get $1 billion. And it was in no small part because we worked together on the priorities. So we, the state board has a strategic plan. We support that strategic plan. Uh, you know, among the things the state board uh, made a priority was uh, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Colleges were doing this anyway, but the state has a goal, and they ask us to report the progress on it. So the overall question is the relationship has been excellent, um, and at the same time, we can point out when things aren't working. I don't want to spend a lot of time at this meeting, especially for those of you who have been here a long time. You know the experience we had five years ago with the launch of CTC Link, right? We know, we know, and especially the everyone in uh, student services, the admissions, financial aid, every part of it uh, was, uh, it was not working. Uh, we also know that there were many, many uh, areas of the financial reporting that were not working. So we spoke out. We, as you know, many of you were part of that testimony. Uh, so I, I feel like we've had a, a relationship where we can honestly say, this isn't working and it's not working for us. And, and uh, I'm not saying it's easy necessarily to always point out, and I'm sure there were a few folks at the state board that often thought like we were always complaining about CTC Link, but, and we did. We did complain often, but it was, um, it needed to be brought to the attention. Uh, but overall, I would say we have had a very uh, healthy relationship where we sometimes agree to disagree. Um, there are, uh, you know, the state board has its, its own role to play, and it is uh, defined in statute, so they follow the law, and then they also know we have local control in our boards. Uh, but overall, it has been very good. And I would say with uh, Jan Yoshiwar herself, a very accomplished woman, very dedicated has been with the system something like 45 years with the state board system, and uh, at one time was at Pierce and Tacoma Colleges, I can't remember in which roles, but the, probably the last 35 or more have been at the state board in many roles, and she has been very innovative with grants and a lot of the things that we've done, uh, the uh, you know uh, innovations, even the, the, uh, uh, the pathway work that is going on with the guided pathway, she has really been a force in that area. So I have great respect for her. And I think that that's broadly shared across our system. Um, the state board is feeling the same pressure that all the college boards are feeling, uh, 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 trying to decide should they go with someone from the outside, from you know across the country who has, or should they go inside within uh, their, the, the colleagues within our system that might be interested. I don't know which way they'll go. Boards have to consider um, strengths and uh, weaknesses. What does a new person from outside bring? Uh, what's needed most? I know they are concerned about um, ensuring that our system of community and technical colleges remains with a strong culture of innovation and attention to workforce and elevating all students of all backgrounds. And so. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, and uh, I, it's a very fine system, so I, anything I can do to keep supporting it and encouraging a new can a chancellor to be a part of it, but also being a part sometimes means we point out what isn't working. It's okay to do that. Thank you for your question. Did I answer both parts? Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Any, anyone I've online? I've got some here if there's nobody else in the audience at the moment. We'll go along. So, um, Dr. Johnson, <clears throat> do you think declining birth rates are something institutions and others should worry about? Why or why not? Well, the, uh, declining birth rates are one of the reasons, um, actually, that, that higher ed finds itself where it is. Um, it's hard to say why people make the decisions they do in their personal lives, but the decisions we make in our personal lives do have an impact on the collective. I'm not going to weigh in on what families should or shouldn't do, but it, uh, what I would say that we, that I wish we had done earlier, and by the we, I mean the royal we of higher ed, we have been hearing about this topic probably for a decade. I remember uh, one of my very good colleagues, David Longenecker, who was, had been the commissioner of higher education in Colorado, then he went to 
Washington DC as an assistant secretary. And then he ran one of the really good organizations, the Western Interstate Commission of Higher Education, WICHI. They wrote a report about 10 years ago that said knocking at the college door. I actually flipped through it uh, not too long ago and this was what they were alerting higher ed about. And I, you know, 10 years out, who, you know, no one pays attention. But they, they had uh, talked about that and had done a whole lot of demographic studies. Um, I don't know what we can do about that, about the birth rate itself, nor, nor is it something we're going to take on as higher ed. But I think it suggests and mandates that we do our business very differently. Uh, because there is, the, you know, that, that uh, one of the, uh, not only is the demographic not there, but I think we should uh, really live, and I think community colleges do, um, the the notion that learning is for life you know we keep learning I hope we learn you know always you know that we we don't just at some age say like there's nothing for me to know or learn so I think we've got to look at that um, I think that as people retire or uh, you know, people once they maybe they want to choose some other interest to consider and I think we we've got to look at all of those things lots of opportunities and lots of challenges for audience, just a, a heads up, about 15 more minutes or so. So if you do have any questions, please um, please do ask. Uh, I've got another one here that was submitted. Um, so Dr. Johnson, what would you say to a prospective student, um, I'm sorry, or a current, current student who was considering dropping out of college? What would you personally say to them? Well, first of all, I would say don't. <laughs> Let me tell you why. And, uh, and, and, and find out about them a little bit. Why is it that they... Um, think that dropping out is the, you know, and we know that many of our students have many challenges. It might be family things, might be financial. Uh, uh, so finding out uh, that and, and also offering that we have a lot of support for them. And so again, if it's financial, we can say we've got financial aid, we've got a foundation. If it's academic of, of you know, saying again, we have a lot of support for you, your faculty, your counselor, our student services professionals. If it's other things, maybe it's they chose the wrong program or wrong for them, they, of saying, uh, try something else. You know, what is it that you like? So really, and I know this is the good work that our uh, student services professionals do, that our counselors do, really trying to keep them here. And if they still decide to leave, but say, don't make this a, a you can always come back and uh, letting them know that there are other opportunities and that we hope to see them back. And even staying in touch, staying in touch with them so we don't, um, and, and again, I know that we now have more technologies and tools to stay in touch with students, but that, uh, it, it's a time where high touch is needed and our students need a lot of support and encouragement and, and helping them through that phase. So I definitely think that uh, not letting them go easy is we can't just let them go. We've got to help them because it will matter if they don't get an education, they're going to have a very tough life and they'll have very little options, very few options to give their families and their own children. And uh, you know, what parents do impacts what children do. So hopefully we, we reach their heart and, and really care about them. So Dr. Johnson, you may have already answered this and the answers that you've already given. So if you had the power to change one thing in higher education, what would it be and what would, the, what would be the first step that you would take? That's a hard one. There are so many things to be done. The one thing to do to change education, um, it would be to uh, uh, change the way the public who is non-supportive of education to get them connected to see the value of it, to change their mind about why they think education is not valuable and influence them to see why it matters so much. That would be, if, if there's one thing I could do, I would want to do that. It would hurt so many people that the people who really believe that, I feel like they would be hurting themselves, their community, their neighborhood, their, uh, that I, I just, that would be with the one thing I would really want to change. Maybe somebody in this room knows how to. So we have another question here. So um, Dr. Johnson, when you started in 2010, obviously the world was a lot different. We were coming out of a recession and basically found ourselves right back into one. So how has the role of chancellor changed since you assumed it at community colleges of Spokane? 
Well, I, I will say first and foremost that uh, in the, you know, 40 years uh, plus it, uh, that I've been in education, different roles, I'd never experienced a pandemic. Never had the challenges that we've had the last few years. So you've gone through, we've gone through a time that is like no other at, uh, you know, well, I, I guess if we go back in time, you know, the Spanish flu way back when, um, maybe educational institutions felt that, but we had not experienced, I had not experienced anything like this. Uh, but going to the question about how ha that has changed everything. The pandemic has changed how we work, what our students need, what our employees need. And so that has, that's a tremendous change. I think we've learned a lot uh, since that time in the last two years. And I, I have to thank everyone at CCS for the professional commitment you've made to be good colleagues, good to our students, hugely supportive. And uh, we, we didn't do telecommuting, and we didn't know that our employees were so adept at and adaptive of, uh, you know, everything's gotten done. And, and I must say, as a boomer with, you know, I always thought like everyone has to be in the office every day, Monday through Friday. I'm amazed and impressed and thankful for the way the whole CCS community has responded and done it with excellence and with ethics and uh, with positive results. So that's just a few of the things, but it's like the world changed. And I don't believe we're going back. So it's not like saying, oh, okay, just, you know, COVID is under control. We're going back to the good old days. I don't see that happening at all. So I think CCS is really positioned to go forward. We've done amazing work at a very hard time. And I think we've shown that we can adapt and we do adapt and uh, lots of innovation and more to come. And, and I think our students too. So I think we're just fundamentally a different organization. And that's what, uh, the, there will be more change. And I don't know that any of us can truly anticipate it, but I think it's being adaptable to change. And then most of all, being focused on our students and their success, and also being a good team with each other. So I think those are the strengths that we have that will carry us through anything. Students first, and uh, great relationships among colleagues where we respect each other and we listen to each other, and together we sort through all the challenges ahead. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. Help me thank Jonathan. He does a marvelous job. And, uh, and thank you all for joining here today, and thank you for anyone who joined by uh, virtually. And uh, just remember, there are other uh, conversations to be had, and this is in response to employee feedback we got about wanting more information, and it's part of our strategic plan. So hope to see you. I think maybe another one will be held at SFCC, and hope to see you there. But thank you for joining today. Thank you, everyone. And have a, go have a great lunch. Thank you. Thank you.